All right, so we are going to get started. Welcome to everybody to another EBFA webinar series. Uh, we have a very special webinar tonight, um, special guest returning, and uh, one of our favorite guest educators tonight. We have Dr. Perry Nicholson. Welcome, Dr. Perry. Oh, thank you so much, Doc, for having me back. I always have such a great time. Excellent. Thank you. So um, before we get started with Dr. Perry, a little bit of... Um, I guess, business or uh, update on EBFA webinars is all of the EBFA webinars are recorded, they're archived, and they will be found on the EBFA YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness. So if you feel that you have to jump off early or you want to listen to this again, then please tune in to the YouTube channel. Dr. Perry is going to run through his presentation, and then at the end, we'll have some time, roughly 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A based off of how many questions there are and how excited we get on the topic. So, um, and then again, please do stay tuned with other EBFA webinars. They are the first or second Thursday of every month. They are always free, and we bring on some great educators um, from around the world to help you guys further your education. So we are going to get started again. Dr. Perry, very good friend and colleague. He is chiropractic physician. He is NKT certified, SFMA, FMS, rock tape. I'm sure there's many, many other ones in there. I'm going to let Dr. Perry have the floor, give us a little bit more information about him and his background, and then dive into his lecture. The floor is yours, Doc. Awesome. Thank you very much, Doc. Uh, you pretty much cover it right there. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time out of your evening and your life to tune in to listen to the webinar. This is a really special one for me um, because I firmly believe that the oblique muscles are a problem in every single person that I've ever come across, including myself. So what's really cool is you get to see some video later of yours truly doing some of the movements that I do on everybody, and I'm going to highlight one of my dysfunctions because yes even uh, the teachers and the people that treat others get dysfunctions so it's kind of cool that you can see it and I give some suggestions on ways that you can help it when you find it but um, I chose the word linchpin for a particular reason uh, because it really is a big part of uh, kind of a missing link in a lot of the conditions that I come across and in, in my business here you can see there that stop chasing pain if you follow me or have not heard of me, is, is my my brand. Uh, and I think the title speaks for itself where um, <coughs> I take care of people that are obviously in pain and they usually end up coming to see me when um, they've tried a lot of other different types of therapies and just can't seem to get across that finish line. I mean, they hit a plateau. And so I look at movement uh, quite a bit. So I'm a SFMA, functional movement screen kind of guy, and I, I teach those courses as well. So I look at human movement to decode the pain puzzle. So that's one of my favorite sayings on the left is that just because you have pain somewhere, it doesn't tell you anything about <coughs> what it is. So it's only telling you, hey, there's an alarm signal here, something's wrong, and we're going to treat that pain, of course, because that's what we do. Uh, but we also want to look somewhere else because the dirty little secret is that it's always somewhere else. There's never just one X marks the spot. And uh, I'm also do rock tape. You see me on the corner there. I'm one of the instructors for rock tape kinesiology tape, just like uh, Dr. Emily is as well. So let's uh, move into the obliques. Uh, we're going to cover uh, some basics, why they matter, why they are extremely important, that you should look at them for everybody, not just you know how they look in the mirror, because just because they look good, doesn't mean that they function good. It's kind of like rear ends. You know, you can have a nice looking booty, but it doesn't mean that you can activate it and use it and engage it when you need it. And the same thing happens to the obliques. We're going to cover what they do, their actions. They, these are really some dynamic muscles that have a lot of control in uh, core and slings of the body and particularly rotation patterns. We're going to show you the ways that uh, to assess it, least I like to assess it when I see someone either in pain or from a performance perspective. So 
if you're listening to this and you're not dealing with people in pain, it's okay because you can still do these assessments and it's a way to see like a kink in the armor, you might say. So if somebody's not able to do these uh, tests and movements efficiently, that should be a red flag for you. Uh, there may be a problem later where they're going to get hurt when you start to ramp up the training or the intensity and the requirements of stability, which you'll see later is force control. But really, if you see a problem with these movements, they have a movement break on, which means they're going to hit a plateau somewhere where they just can't get past it. No matter how hard they push themselves or how hard they train, the body won't let them get any further than that, that wall that they're going to hit. And the obliques are some great linchpins for that. And then I'm going to go over how to reset them very easily uh, with my rail uh, reset system that we'll go over later. So let's move on to the one here where we, this is one of my favorite pictures because it represents what the obliques are to me, which is a central linchpin here. So because they are such a pivotal role in flexion and side bending and particularly rotation and stability, that if they're gone, all those other powerhouse chains that you have connected to them are not going to be as efficient. So you can consider those your two arms and your legs and your head, as a matter of fact. So if the obliques are off and you pull that linchpin, then the rest of the body is going to have to adapt in some way, shape, or form, um, or what I like to call compensations, or what I really like to call is cheat. So if you take away those obliques, there's going to be chaos in the entire system. So I, I tell everybody and I stand by it that if, if you have pain in your body somewhere, I guarantee you, you are going to have an oblique dysfunction. The oblique to where that side of pain is or the oblique to the oblique on the opposite side because they have to work in pairs. And we'll show you a little bit more about that as we go along. So I'm just going to review um, the joint by joint theory here. Some people are familiar with this. If you follow the work of Gray Cook, uh, bringing physical therapists into mental and mind, or you follow uh, Mike Boyle, who's a, a strength conditioning coach up in Boston, who uh, also works with the world champion Red Sox. And both of those guys kind of came up with this together. And it's just straightforward logical to me. And basically, if you look at the picture, it just gives you an alternating stacking uh, your joints to where some should be more mobile than stable. So every, every joint in your body, obviously, should be mobile and should be stable. But each one should be a little bit more than the other. So for instance, we want to have a lot of ankle mobility. So we have the ability to run, walk, move the way we want to without restriction. And we want to be more stable in the knee. We don't want a lot of movement in that guy because then we're going to get tears and meniscus problems and all sorts of stuff. And you want to be mobile in your hip as well. So you can see they alternate up as we go. But one of the things that I've found when working with people is I, I tell you straight out of the gate that I am a stability guy 100%. So if you have any kind of problem in your body, even if it's a mobility one, my contention is that you have an underlying stability problem that was there way long before you had a mobility problem. So if you crank on mobility anywhere in your body, um, I teach people to back it up with stability around the area that you're freeing up, of course, but also in the central core and not just your rectus abdominis and your transverse abdominis and your glutes, but one of the biggest linchpins that is missing are uh, activating the obliques. So you'll see later when we look at some of these cross body patterns that Let's go down to the ankle, for instance. So a lot of people know, uh, who are exposed to it, to do ankle mobility drills, right, to try to increase movement and motion in your ankle. And I know Emily covers all this stuff fantastic with her programs and certifications and her master instructors. But kind of a baseline here is that if you go after that ankle mobility and it keeps coming back where it locks down again. And that very often happens on a lot of people where they just tell me, I've always got to try to free up my ankle or I always have my tight calf or my tibialis anterior or my peroneals. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look and say, okay, well, you have to use that ankle when you walk. And if you want to walk, you got to use your obliques. Otherwise, you're not going anywhere quick, fast, and in a hurry, at least efficiently. So I look for the ankle mobility is being tied to instability, inefficient function in the obliques. So you'll see later with the rail system of how we would free up the ankle, but then we would activate your oblique rotational system. And that can make a significant and huge impact on your body beginning to lock down your ankle. So if you go to the next slide here, the reason that is is because uh, stability is force control. It's one of my favorite slides. I actually created that. I mean, that's really freaking cool. Right? Um, but the stability, all that is is force control, is the ability to absorb it. So let's say that you're walking. You've got to have that foot strike the ground. You've got to absorb it. Then you've got to direct and disperse that force up through your body, up through the joints, up through the fascia of your body. Then it's got to cross your body, and you've got to be able to generate force through via to keep walking, and then you've got to release it out of the opposite side. So if you have a mobility restriction, or you have pain, or you have myofascial restrictions, or trigger points, or any of those things, you have lost the ability to efficiently do this absorb, direct, disperse, generate, and release. And the linchpin in that is the center core of your body. And what will happen is that if you're not stable in that center core, your brain does not want you to move a lot. So it, it actually starts to get really freaked out and it starts to get scared because it's not stable and I use the word safety. So if your brain doesn't think that you feel safe for movement, it's not going to let you move as well or as much as it could. So if we go back to that case of the ankle, if you're not stable in your core, your body may just decide to, okay, well, I don't want this guy cranking on running and, and really pushing himself because he can't rotate well in his obliques or side bend well. So I'm going to sacrifice his hip or I'm going to sacrifice his ankle. So he can't generate that force. Even if he wants to, he's going to hit a wall. But unfortunately, we always want to keep pushing through stuff. And then eventually, your body will say to you, okay, we've gone back and forth where I'm locking stuff down, I'm tightening stuff up, and you keep pushing through it, and I keep putting it back, and we're going back and forth and back and forth. And your body says, okay, I'm tired of this. I'm going to up the ante. I'm going to win. Now I'm going to send some pain your way. Here comes the hurt lock. And then bam, all of a sudden you get pain and you don't know why. So the reason you got it is because your body just had the ultimate win of stability. Nothing makes you more stable than you're not able to freaking move. So pain is going to restrict you from moving. So it all comes down, in my mind, to stability in the nervous system. So if we go to the next slide, some of the ways you can make yourself stable is you've got the fascial systems, of course. So the myofascial lines via Thomas Myers. This is a picture of the deep line, which is one of the primary systems of core stability in the body. And then you've got your intra-abdominal pressure on the right side. So that's the first one. The one on the right is, is the king. It's the top of the food chain. And that's the inner cylinder where it's like a pressurized balloon with your diaphragm and your pelvic floor, transverse abdominis and multiply, as you see there. So that comes first, and then wrapped around that, is going to be your different fascial layers that you have. And then you're going to have subsystems of movement, these force transmissions of the force generated across these myofascial lines. Some are represented in Thomas Myers. The other ones I'm going to show you here are represented in Andre Vlemming's work and Diane Lee, which I'm a big follower of. So if you flip the next slide then you're going to be able to see all these subsystems. So the deep longitudinal sling is absolutely critical, and you'll see that these, this sling here, every single one of them is going to have something to do with your SI joint and your pelvic control, because they're going to go diagonally across your body. So this subsystem on the left is actually one of the very first ones to develop when you are learning to move. And when I teach my courses, I tell you that if you have a chronic sacroiliac problem or low back problem, doesn't resolve, this subsystem is the key. This is the big culprit, and you'll always find 
an oblique problem. And these things relate to each other. So if you have a dysfunctional deep longitudinal sling, that means you're going to have a defective lateral, anterior, and posterior. So if you look at the ones particularly anterior and posterior, those are the ones that we're really going to see today. But I want you to take a look at the anterior oblique sling, the second one down on the bottom. You can see the external oblique and the internal oblique are there. But these are going to connect and bleed down into and connect through fiber orientation all the way down into your adductors. So one of the things that you'll find is if you have chronic adductor issues, strains, pulls, anything like that, then that can be because you don't have an efficient external and internal oblique. So if you do not rotate well in your obliques, you will cross over or flex your leg up further, faster, harder, stronger, longer to compensate from that. So if you have any problem in your inner thigh, you had best look at the obliques. And if you look on the back side, then we're going to go into the posterior oblique sling because if the anterior oblique sling is defective, you are by naturally of a domino effect going to have a deficient, inefficient posterior oblique sling as well. And you can see the two muscles that tie in there that are mostly inhibited on everybody that I see is that their ass is asleep at the wheel, the glute max, and then the latissimus dorsi muscle doesn't work either because we're rounded forward, we're hunched over, we've got this turtle shell where our head is forward, translation, and it gets into the room 10 minutes before your torso, right? So if you have that rounded thoracic spine and rounded shoulders, you are not activating your lat and you are going to be not rotating well. So if I see you walk in with that posture, I automatically know that your obliques pretty much suck and that I need to look at how they are functioning in relationship to the thoracic spine and the lumbar spine. So these subsystems here, what's powerful about these is it doesn't matter where you are in your life, if you're 85 or you're 25 or you're 5 or you work out or you don't work out. We all have to learn to use these subsystems of movement in order to move and we all develop them the exact same way. Right? Maybe a little bit earlier or later in life, but we all had to go through the same transition to develop them. So if I can help you turn these back on, and use them efficiently. That's when you take off the brakes to performance and then your brain remembers that pattern and then it's gonna let you put the foot on the gas and really, really go. So if you look to the next slide here, we're gonna go through these pretty quick. Um, I pretty much will stand by this. If you have pain, you I usually put may just to be safe, but I can tell you that 100% of the time you're gonna have an oblique problem that's going on in there. So then, if we go into here where you've got a training plateau. So maybe you've got an issue where you you can't get your bench press up anymore, or you can't get your deadlift up anymore, and then you want to just stack more weight on there to do that, but you can't. So then this is where I want you to do this assessment and look into the obliques because you're probably going to find an issue with the oblique that will tie into a hip instability problem or a lat or a glute problem. And last time I checked, if you really want to pull some heavy weight or push some heavy weight, you need your lat and your ass to do it. So otherwise you're going to hit a wall. So let's meet the obliques. So we're, I'm going to go through this a little briefly here with the external oblique. But if you look at the picture of the anatomy slide, you can see the fiber orientation with these guys. So they pretty much layer each other. So you know the external oblique, what that looks like, because I call it the Brad Pitt muscle, right? It's the one on the magazine that everybody wants. And then you have your internal oblique below that. So they form an X. And the external oblique, what's really fascinating about that is it bleeds into and fastly attaches to your serratus anterior. So when they do these studies of looking at the muscles, you can pretty much um, consider those one muscle. So if you have a shoulder dysfunction, for instance, you will probably have a serratus anterior dysfunction, which means that you will have an external oblique dysfunction in some way, shape, or form. And that all comes down to how they relate so you can rotate your torso when you move. 
and it's one of the primary rotators of your spine. So if you will look later when we rotate, how are you going to need those? And they're really, really important in pelvic tilt. So most people today have an anterior pelvic tilt. So when they're walking around, they've got that upper cross syndrome of Yonda. So if you're an anterior pelvic tilt, you can pretty much already think to yourself that those external obliques might not be very efficient. And because they attach to the rib cage and they should be playing a role in helping to depress the rib cage, if somebody has an elevated rib cage, this big open space in their abdomen, and they don't breathe well through their diaphragm and they breathe through their shoulders and they're hollowing out, then I'm automatically in my mind going to the obliques are a dysfunctional system. And they play a very pivotal role in side bending. So there's many different synergistic muscles that are supposed to bend you to the side, two of them primarily being your quadratus lumborum and your lumbar paraspinals and your external internal oblique. So if you have an external oblique, for instance, on your left side that is dysfunctional and side bending, well then your body and your brain has to use either the QL or the ipsilateral same side lumbar paraspinals or internal oblique to get you further over. So if you have, for instance, a quadratus lumborum that's jacked up and you don't know why, it may be because the external oblique that's supposed to work with it to bend you to the same side is not working well. So you can crank the hell out of that quadratus lumborum with a trigger point ball or your elbow or whatever, but it's never going to stay until you can engage and give your body back the external oblique it needs to move you from there. And it's also a very big um, uh, player with a trunk flexion with the rectus abdominis. So let's go to the next one here. Uh, so the internal oblique is probably my favorite one because nobody ever thinks about it. Nobody ever comes to me and says, Doc, I got back pain and my internal oblique hurts. Can you take a look at it? They have no idea what the hell it is. But it's really a critical muscle because that guy attaches to the thoracolumbar fascia. And the thoracolumbar fascia, if you remember the slides from the past, that is a big part of the posterior oblique sling. So it also will attach to your psoas, it's going to attach to your diaphragm, and it's also a player in posterior pelvic tilt. And it plays a critical role in intra-abdominal pressure. And in my opinion, it should be put into that picture that we showed you with the intrinsics of your diaphragm, your pelvic floor, transverse abdominis, and multifidi. I would actually include the internal oblique in that system as well. So I always check it. If you come into me and you say, Doc, you know, my little toe hurts and I don't know why, guess what I'm checking? I'm checking your obliques because I know that that may be an issue with your little toe. I mean, that's how critical these guys are. So if you flip the slide, I'm going to show you here just a recap of those systems. So now you can see just how important those players would be in there, particularly on that bottom right one of that thoracolumbar fascia. Really, really working a lot if you don't have your lat and you don't have your glute. So if we go to the next slide, so when I take a look at somebody, I start with all the other things that you guys probably already know how to do. You just look at them in a static posture. So I'm sorry, I didn't have any pictures of my patients to put up here. I just took these off of Google. But if you take a look at somebody here and you look at this guy on the left, well, he's, he's in an anterior pelvic tilt. So I probably know that I'm dealing with obliques that don't work well. His rib cage is elevated up. He's got some rounded shoulders forward. His head is tilted forward. And he's got that curve in his low back. But if you look at from the rear as well, because the obliques play a role in side bending, if I have a difference between masses and spaces between my, my rib cage and my pelvis, where my QL and my obliques sit, I'm going to suspect that there's an asymmetry in my ability to bend one way and bend the other way. And you need to look at the muscle development too. So if I look at my right external oblique, for instance, and it's bigger than my left external oblique, that should tell you that my right external oblique does more than my left. So there's an asymmetry because your body will develop a muscle that you're using more as opposed to the one that is not efficient. So you need to check for tone as well. So you'll palpate the external internal obliques and look for tone. It'll be very mushy. It'll have a little bit of give to it. It just won't feel very stable. 
and if you look at a picture with posture, if you have any rotation at all, where the right shoulder is rotated forward more than the left, so that there's any twisting or torsion in the body, then that's a classic sign that you have a problem with your oblique system. So if we go to the next one, um, I'm going to show you. She's going to click on the video. This is what I do. This is me, and I have no shoes on. That's for you, Doc. Thank you. Um, feet together, and I'm just doing torso rotation. And it's too much to get into here, but I'm just looking how well I can rotate to one side compared to the other side. My hands will go over my head. I'm going to lean backwards, and you can't see it from that way, but my right side drifts backwards. And I'm turning left, and I'm bending right. So basically what's happening there is I'm looking, when I rotate to the left, okay, um, I'm using my right external oblique and my left internal oblique. Right external, left internal goes this way. I go the other way. It's left external, right internal. And then my hands will go overhead, and this is leaning back. So this is anti-rotation. So they're supposed to flex me forward and prevent me from rotating. My right side goes back further, so my right external oblique has some inhibition. Now I'm bending sideways. So now I'm looking at the side bending component of it. So remember the obliques are going to flex me forward. They're going to bend me to the side and they're going to rotate me. So I need to look at all those. So if I cannot rotate further to one side than the other side, like for me, I'm restricted in rotation because my right external oblique has some inhibition into it. And you'll see it show up later. So you'll see that I'm not as comfortable bending to the right not as comfortable rotating to the left <laughs> and my shoulder pops back on the right because I can't hold myself forward. So now I'll we'll move to the next slide and this is just a running list for you guys to look at later of when you stand and rotate and you stand and bend sideways the concentric and eccentric actions of each one of those muscles because you have to remember with the obliques one set's got to bring you there the other set's got to let you get there so one's working concentrically one's working eccentrically so it just takes a little practice to get these obliques down because when you're looking at movement and someone can't say I cannot rotate to my left as well. So say if I'm standing rotation, I rotate to the left. That means that my left internal or my right external may not be strong enough to rotate me to the left or my right internal and my left external may be too tight, eccentrically stuck to not let me get there. So one may be not strong enough to take me there. The other one is working too much and won't let me get there. So let's flip the slide. So this is about a two-minute video here. Uh, you can see this is when I'm doing a pop-off press. So I'm having a band wrapped around my wrist, and this band is pulling me to the left. Now the band is pulling me to the right, so I have to twist left. So this is left thoracic spine rotation and that is very difficult for me you can see I'm struggling now my hands are overhead and I'm checking right side bend pile off left side bend pile off and I have it wrapped around my wrist because if you grip the band the grip can make up for a poor core now I go down on my knees it's a little more challenging but I'm doing the same thing and this is great because I can look at get my hips able to, to go forward Am I caving in? And I have dorsiflexion in my ankles. I don't like to have my feet plant or flex because you can contract your calf and cheat and make it stronger. Now I'm going to do half kneeling. So then I'm going to come forward. It's right thoracic spine rotation with half kneeling. So it's really checking my hip stability on one side. And then it's the other side. So this is much more difficult for me to do. So if you have a poor hip stability in this condition, then you have to tie your obliques into the rehab of your hip stability on that downward leg. Now I'm going to show you we're going to get on the ground into a supine, what's called a pile-off press. So now there's very little stability that I need from anywhere, and it's just looking at very low loaded thoracic spine rotation. So that's right thoracic spine rotation. And this one is actually left thoracic spine rotation. This one is much more difficult for me to do. Okay, So I usually will start my patients right there to see where their weakness is. And then now I'm going to show you one of my favorite ones. This is a creeping pattern. So this is a very powerful one where you get down and you see, can you bring your knee and your elbow together on the same side? 
and then I'm going to do the other side. Watch my other side. It's going to be much more difficult for me to do it on the right side. See, I can't touch them, and when, in order to get there, I have to lift my hip in the air, and I have to use my foot. So that's a very important system here because this ties in your external oblique and your serratus anterior and your lat, and because your knee is bending up, it's tying, it's using your sartorius muscle. So if you look at movement patterns, your external oblique, your lat, and your sartorius muscle bleed together. That's how you can bring your knee up towards your elbow. If I cannot do that, that means my external oblique on the right side for me has some inhibition. And if you saw, I lifted my hip in the air, which means I'm using my sartorius muscle a little more in the front. So now that you know why I have a hip joint jam, because I'm not stable in my core, so my hip is jacking up for me. So if you flip the slide to the next one, you'll see my friend Evan doing it for me. So the first slide is if you can't touch anybody or work with anybody, use the bands, but otherwise you have somebody else push on you. So now I'm doing rotation. So he's pushing on the right and I'm pushing right. So now I'm checking right thoracic spine rotation. Now hands overhead. I'm bending to the left and rotating forward. He's going to try to push me over so I'm checking my right obliques. See how unstable I am. I can't hold it. Now the left one, he's going to go. I'm much stronger on the left. And then he's going to go back to the right. Now watch the right again because I said watch. You'll see how much these he's. You'll push me right over. Watch. So I'm unstable. So my obliques cannot side bend. I even see it. I'm laughing and I know they suck. Right? Thumbs down. Right? Um, he even says it. So then we're going to get into tall kneeling. So with tall kneeling, what we're doing is we're taking out certain structures to see if I'm a little stronger or a little weaker. So now when I'm down on the ground, see I'm not able to use my feet as much, right? So it's going to be a lot harder for me to hold when I do that. Now I'm going to go, <coughs> um, uh, let's see if he's doing the same one. Yeah, I think I wanted to go over just how bad it is. Now I'm going to be pretty strong on this one, I think, on this slide if I remember. I just filmed this today. See the difference when I'm in half kneeling as opposed to standing up? So that means that there's an issue that I got to look at down low for me <coughs> on my feet, right? Which, Doc, you know that. Everybody's got a foot problem, right? Exactly. And then, so this is the half kneeling pile off. Watch me. He's going to go right over. Goodbye. Okay. And he's going to do the other side. Goodbye. I mean, that's pretty embarrassing, actually. I'm not faking that either. So then we go the same way. So basically what this is telling me is I have some massive hip stability problems because I have an oblique problem. So I need to tie those two together because of the cross-body pattern. And I was able to make that much, much stronger when I took my foot in the back. And then I didn't dorsiflex it, I plantar flexed it. And I, I leaned on my calf, so I'm using my calf now, and then he can't push me over. Right. So basically what that means is if I'm using my calf to make up for poor rotation, then I put my, that's where I took my calf back out of it. So if you have a calf that's always tight and you have a runner that's always getting issues, you have to check the obliques because they're probably using their calf for their obliques. Right. Does that make sense? Uh, next slide. Okay, so the release, they're very, very simple. So I'm going to show you the release, the rail system. It's release, activate, integrate, locomotion. It has to be done in this order. So if you flip the side, I'll give you a small example. So say if somebody comes into me and you have pain in your adductors on your right thigh, I'm going to do those assessments. And then what I'm going to look for here is I will probably notice poor patterning in your oblique structure. On that one, <laughs> you will typically find the left external and right internal because when your right leg comes forward, your upper spine rotates to the right. Okay, So what you're going to do is you would release the adductors on the right side, on the inner thigh, where you have your pain, where you have your discomfort. Okay? And then you're going to activate the oblique rotational pattern to turn that on. So you release what's working too much, then you rotate after that to activate those, and you integrate those together in a movement pattern using the TRX rip chain or a great cook bar. And then one of the most important things that I'm going to tell you to walk away with here is that if you find 
for instance, an external oblique on your right that does not work well, you need to automatically look on the opposite side that the other external oblique may be doing too much. So one muscle will work and the other one might not because they have to work in functional unit pairs. So one of the things that I tell people is if you have a weak oblique on one side, go check the other side for overworking and vice versa. That's an extremely powerful reset of the same muscle patterns uh, going in for a synergistic movement pattern. Next slide. Okay, so these are my favorites to use. Uh, I'm a big uh, rip trainer guy, I mean, because uh, I, I teach for TRX too. That's one of my favorite pieces of equipment. That's all slings and rotation right there. And on the bottom, that's the great cook bar. So, I mean, geez, you can just get a dowel rod, put a screw in the end of it, and just start playing around with it. You don't have to go crazy. But the idea is to use these patterns so you have to fight rotation. So look, and these, you can just hold it when you get in the position and re, uh, try to fight the, the rotational force to pull you out of it because they are anti-rotation. So very, very important when you do these, that when you start, you don't, have to, you don't go heavy, heavy weight. This is about stability, not about strength. Next one. All right, so big takeaways. Uh, the oblique should be assessed in every single person that comes in to see you. If they have a hangnail, I want you to look at the obliques because they're probably going to be involved. So, and just because the obliques look good doesn't mean they function good. I can tell you that I've seen people that have the best set of abs I've ever seen and they can't do squat, literally. And then anti-rotation is the name of the game. So that's what the Poloff Press is. I have written many articles about the Poloff Press. So just go on the internet and type in my name and Poloff, P-A-L-L-O-F, and you will see articles I've written on the Poloff Press and core stabilization. And work with them on the rail system. I will tell you it is something that I teach in my eight-hour workshop in more detail because it will be the linchpin, the break uh, that will give you your force back because everything you're going to need to do, especially in sports, if you're going to not just stand there and lift something and you're going to move, these guys you need. All right? And you guys can, I think that's the end of it, you guys can check me out on my website of stopchasingpain.com and just type in my name and you'll find plenty of stuff to read. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Doc, so much. Sorry, I went long. See, I told you I got to cut those slides short, man, because I keep No, I, I didn't even notice. Because <laughs> you weren't even listening, right? You're, too, and you're playing on your phone. No, I, I was so into it, Doc. I'm writing all over this, <laughs> taking notes. Oh, you're laying over there doing it? <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. was, I was, yes. Um, Those are really fun patterns to do. I mean, they're awesome because they reveal so much information, and very few people do that. So uh, it's a really, really, a, it can be great for training, but it should be essential for part of your initial assessment. Yeah, no, I think that those are great. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can type them in below. If you can see on the control panel, there should be something, an area where you can type the questions and then we'll go over those. Um, well, hopefully I'll get one or two. Harry, for a few minutes. So I have two questions while we're waiting. Yep. Um, so your assessments, when you're doing the, um, the assessments where you started standing and then kneeling and then mm -hmm. you, you started, you always start in the hardest situation, in a sense? No. Uh, it, actually, what I'll do is it, I'll start you standing up first because I want to see what you got on um, okay. where you probably live most of your life, right? Okay. Standing up. So uh, based on what I see there, then uh, sometimes I'll take you immediately down on your back onto the ground. So when you're standing, you need massive stability, right? Then when you're lying on your back, you don't need any. So then those little, the middle is the breakout. So then I can take you from one to the other, and then I can change position and find exactly where your linchpin is. Mm -hmm. Where do you, where is your weakness? Where do you like to live? So I can see where you feel safe, where you move efficiently, and right on that zone where you lose it. And that's where I have to keep you. That's where I have to bring you back in order to make sure that we can bring you a full scale from top to bottom. Okay. Um, and then my other question before we go into other people's questions, was those assessment techniques, then you use those as your activation? They can be. The easiest way to do it is is that you know how you're testing them and they can't do it. Uh -huh. uh, once I do a corrective and, and I do that rail reset, then the easiest way is to, one, see if it can get back into their position 
and that they can do that position efficiently. Because when you're really looking at movement, uh, it's very simple. So if I put you down into that crawling position, for instance, right, mm -hmm. and you can see that I could do it easily on my left side, and then on my right side, I got stuck. And then one of the things that I do for people is when they get stuck, then I tell them, okay, I want you to get unstuck, which means I want you to cheat. I want you to do whatever your body is telling you to do to touch your knee to your elbow. And then when I see what they do in order to have to complete that movement, I know what their compensation is. I know what their driver is because that's what they would be having to do all the time in any movement pattern. So then I have to attack it from there to say, what did you use that you're not supposed to use to make that pattern happen? And then I have to take that away so you can use what you're supposed to be using in that pattern. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, excellent. Thank you. Um, so just there's like questions and comments and all this wonderful stuff Good. in the area. Um, mm -hmm. Some people ask just a little bit of um, not directly related to Dr. Perry. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. One second. As far as where the the webinar is going to be found after this so you guys can listen to it again because i know um as dr perry was running through and he was like concentric eccentric you you know you guys probably want to see that again um oh yeah, it, yeah. so it's, it's going to be on the ebfa youtube channel which is youtube.com backslash ebfa fitness so that's where you can find it um those deep longitudinal slings that you had that was you first showed um anatomy trains and then was the other one Diane Lee yeah so the, the well the the, uh, the subsystems are from Diane Lee and Andre Fleming um, though they're the ones who kind of pioneered the movement subsystems they're called movement subsystems and that's just one graphic representation of it so if you go into Google and you type in uh, subsystems of movement you know Diane Lee or Andre Vlemming, uh, you'll see many different ways to represent it, but you should really, really look at those. Okay. Those are just some of my favorites. Okay, excellent. Um, so I have a question from one of my barefoot rehab specialists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, going Yay. to um, ask when you, and I guess it could be a way that a person could explore a little bit more, is she asked specifically how critical is neutral subtalar joint position when you're testing or would you theoretically test them and if you notice that they have like pronation you can put them in subtalar joint neutral and then reassess the obliques yes you can so yeah. i want to see where they are when i when i look at them so i'm going to say okay i want you to do this movement but i'm not going to make it so challenging either so the idea behind those bands is you know i can't make them so hard that you have to cheat in order to hold it out there. So I've got to find that threshold for you. Um, but the great thing about the pop-off press is that when you take that band and you're checking rotation, as soon as I, if I have, if you saw the one in the beginning, I have it very close to my body and then I'll just straighten my arms out, right? So they will notice instantly a difference from one side to the other side. And then you have to be very observant so when you're more skilled at looking at movement, you will be able to see these subtle compensations. So if I did see that, for instance, say for me, if I had inhibition or weakness on my thoracic spine rotation to the left, then I would be watching what's happening down below, and then I could go easily make an adjustment down there on the foot okay, and say, okay, hold this position and now do it. Uh -huh. And then if I see a change, well, then there you go. Then you've got the link that you have. But you can also see from there, for me, you know, it changed when I took the foot out of it for me. So mm -hmm. I did it standing, and then I went down, and I took my foot out of it. So then there was a little bit of a change in what happened. So then that's how I know where I should be looking in my zone of compensation. Okay, perfect. Great question, great answer. So they were right, yeah. That was a good yes. question. All right, so, um, uh, okay, here's kind of a long question. Um, Something about hip replacement. If I had a hip replacement and the PT did not test the obliques and thus did not include oblique work in the rehab, is this a bit negligent? Uh, limits full rehabilitation. Um, would the hip replacement have been a band-aid to the real problem? So um, 
I guess a little bit of like, if it's neglected, what's the impact down the road? And Yeah. So well, I look at it this way. So why did you need a hip replacement? So obviously, if it was traumatic, right, then you shattered your hip, that's different. But if you have a wear and tear hip replacement, okay, so usually it's just one side that goes. So why is that one side needed and the other one didn't? So then you're, you're bleeding energy and force from somewhere. So then your body, like we talked in the beginning, is locking down your hip, is jamming your hip in the socket to make you stable. So that's probably why it's degenerating. So in my opinion, if somebody needed a hip replacement because the hip is worn out, I know your obliques are dysfunctional because they were not able to transmit and absorb and generate force efficiently through what we do every single day, whether you work out or not, which is walk if you can. So if you get the hip replaced, you're going to feel great because that's the part that had damage to it and was sending you pain signals. And it's probably going to work really well on that hip, but if you don't get your obliques back online, well, your body's going to bleed force through another joint. So maybe you're going to start to get it now in your opposite side shoulder, or maybe you're going to get it in the knee, or you're going to get it in the opposite hip. It's just going to, it's going to be like water. It's going to take the path of least resistance to disperse that force out. So the answer is your oblique, in my opinion, was a cause for the hip to go in the first place. And when you get it replaced, if you don't tie in the obliques, you will probably get another issue later down the line. Doesn't mean you will. Some people are great at compensation and adaptation and you got no problems and there's unicorns and rainbows and everybody loves each other. But most of the time, people are going to get something, and they're going to like, I don't know why my shoulder hurts. I didn't do anything. Well, then I'm looking at your obliques as I treat your shoulder. Okay, excellent. Um, now, the question is, when you're doing the assessments, so the different mm -hmm. pellet presses, do you want to do the stronger side first or the inhibited? Like, what side do you choose, or does it matter? Well, you know, I kind of take that from my mentor, Greg Cook, is, you know, I watch him move, so I kind of know where once, because so, for, say, for instance, I put you in uh, your feet together, and I put your feet together for a reason, because when your feet together, you are already on an unstable base, so I'm freaking out your brain, and I can see if anything is rotating, so it's much more stable when I look at standing thoracic rotation. So if you remember me in the first video, when I rotated, <laughs> Whatever side somebody rotates to initially is probably subconsciously, innately in their brain, the side they feel most functional on. So if I suck rotating to the right, I'm probably going to rotate to the left when you ask me to do it. So when I tell somebody, I want you to twist and turn and rotate to one side, I'm going to see which side they choose to go to. It's probably going to be the one they feel more comfortable going to. Mm -hmm. And then I'll see how they go the other way. And then what I'll do is when I test them, I'll usually test them on a side that I think they are going to be strong on. And then I'll test an inhibited side. The reason I do that is because uh, they feel really nice and strong. They feel good. They think everything's okay. And then I go to the other one, and then it really hits home of, holy cow, this side feels much different than the other side. Mm -hmm. So when I look at movement assessment, I never tell them which leg to lift, which way to rotate, which way to bend. I let them decide. And then which way they move tells me which way they feel more safe, which way they feel more stable. Because you will not bend into a side that sucks. That's just stupid. So you'll go to the other side, right? So it really tells me a lot when I shut up and just watch you move. Okay, awesome. Um, what are the specific release and activation techniques you, you use or you prefer? Um, it could be really anything you like, whatever floats your boat. The dirty little secret is they all work. So, for instance, you know, you could use a foam roller. You could use a, uh, a, a tiger tail, a stick. Um, you can do uh, ART. You can drop needles in it, whatever you want. So, for instance, if I had the uh, right adductors were really, really tight, um, for instance, I could easily get on a foam roller on those right adductors. And then after I release those, then I need to activate the obliques in that pattern. And all I would have to do is basically rotate my spine to the right. So what's, what's really great about the rail system is that a lot of people foam roll their inner thighs, right? 
So they're like, man, my inner thighs hurt. It really sucks to roll in there and I stretch it. But they'll roll it and then they'll just go and roll the other one and then they'll go roll something else right after that. So they're rolling and releasing everything, but they never activate anything after it in a pattern. So what I want to do is I want to release what's working too much and activate what's not working enough in a, in a particular movement pattern. And there's no movement pattern that is more powerful to do the rail system with than the one that we use every day, and that's walking. Does that make sense? Yep, that was great. I mean, it made sense to me. But <laughs> um, All right, so uh, there's many, many questions. And um, mm -hmm. <laughs> as much as I would love to keep going on forever, um, we'll, we'll do a couple more. And sure. if, yeah, yeah. if there's anyone who we don't, answer them then i just i'm apologizing in advance because there's just so many um well that's good so they can email you or go to one of your workshops um yeah sure no problem they can do that you know i take message i take uh people send me emails or you know they even message me through uh, my stop chasing pain on facebook and i'll be happy to get back to you and let you know because uh, I think this stuff is life changing. I mean, it's it's not just a pile off press and a bleed to me. This stuff right here can absolutely change another human being's life without a doubt. It's that powerful. Yeah, I I know from experience. Yeah. Um, so someone asked if you and I ever teach together. <laughs> we did once. We did, and we need fun. to we need to set something up and do it again. I agree. Um, here's a great question because it involves CrossFit, which is kind of a hot topic. Um, uh, so this, um, professional teaches or treats a ton of CrossFitters and have always worked inside out. I do a basic assessment for proximal core stability, which is usually lacking. Um, mm -hmm. this population loves to do a ton of skill work and I give them tall kneel ball rotation tosses, half kneel ball chops. Is this counterproductive? if given as general exercise without specific evaluation? Great question. Um, well, I'm, that's a tough one because, you know, I too treat a lot of CrossFit and then they're in great shape and they're powerhouses, but I do find a lot of them have some major uh, lack of stability and inhibition and in basic moves. So they're really strong. They're badass monsters when they can turn on the gas so if I put a ball in their hand and then I tell them to whip it and throw it, I mean, they're using a lot of different muscle patterns to make that happen, right? So they can, elite athletes and people who train like that are very good compensators. They can cover stuff up and really hide it well. So what happens is, but if I take it back and then I do these patterns first with very um, low threshold of, needing strength like with the bands or if you can touch someone pushing on them because then it's a different story so if they have for instance a weakness in one of those half kneeling pile off presses there I guarantee you that if they're gonna whip that ball they're whipping it from the wrong place because they can't do it without the ball just from basic low load stability so they they can do it and they may not get hurt. I'm not saying that if you have this problem, that means that you're gonna you're, you're gonna fall apart and your body's a disaster. It might not ever be a problem. But when I work with CrossFit people, I come from this angle: is that you don't even realize how much stronger, better, faster you could be than you are because this break is on and you didn't even know it. So I would have them master that first and take away what they're compensating with. And then I would have them, okay, now go over in the corner and slam that ball as hard as you want. Let me know how it feels now as compared to when you were doing it before. So um, the key to those movements is to regress them back so um, the person is not bracing and using strength to power through. They're actually using true stability. Does that make sense? So you're digressing everyone? Everyone gets digressed. Because okay. it's like it's like with rolling patterns, you know. I mean, that's the ultimate down on the ground. If you can't do some of these basic patterns down on the ground, I know when you stand up and do them, you're doing them from the wrong place. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't mean that you're going to get hurt. But my contention is that if I can get you to do this efficiently on the ground, I'm going to make you that much more of a badass when you stand up. Because I know that you don't have stability because you should be able to do this down on the ground. 
you should be able to hold a pile off press line on your back. And if it can't, and you can hold it standing up, that means you're pulling from somewhere else that's the wrong place to be pulling from. And what that means for somebody in the long run is that your career may be kind of short because you may not be able to have that durability factor because you're pulling from all the wrong places. Or you may um, have a high, uh, a low threshold of a fatigue factor when you do it. So for me, stability is the name of the game. I got to find out, you know, where that edge is for you to be stable. And if you can, if you can be stable on the easiest movements that I give you, that impresses me way more than if you can be stable when I push on you hard, because it's the light ones that do it. Because when you're light like that the brain lets go and then you can't cheat from things and I know you can pull the strength, the stability from where you need to. So I'm impressed when you can hold back feather light stuff. I'm not impressed when you can pull 300 pounds off the floor. Excellent. So at least in my world, at least in my world from movement enhancement and making sure that you can do what you love better, faster, stronger, harder, longer and not get hurt. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and that was a great answer. I think, dealing with just many CrossFit patients myself, it's um, a, a great area to kind of tap in and help those athletes who do want to offset yeah. that fatigue and kind of in the way that you were talking about. So um, yeah. I think that's great. So um, so we're going to wrap it up. It's been a nice hour with you, Dr. Perry. Went fast. Sure did. Wow. <laughs> so um, thank you again for um, taking the time. Dr. Perry, we love to have you on EBFA webinars and kind of over on the side of the, the area. Um, and I just want to thank everybody who did take the time to tune in. Um, again, if you want to listen in again, please check out the YouTube channel where it will be recorded and archived. And then please do tune in for all of our other webinars. Again, first Thursday of every month, they're free. We bring in some great professionals. Um, and we explore all facets of human movement from like an integrated functional perspective. So um, thank you again, Dr. Perry, if you want to give your website one last time and then we'll call it a night. Oh, sure. Thank you. It was a blast. Um, it's uh, very simple. It's stopchasingpain.com. Type in those. So you'll find anything you ever want to know. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Thank you again. Have a great night, everybody. And we will hopefully see you again on an EBFA webinar or in one of our workshops. Take care.